Horror films have been among my favorites, whether it be the late Nicholas Rogues, Don't Look Now, to William Friedkin's The Exorcist, of course, The Shining. Daddy? So I thought it felt only natural to segue into the horror genre. Scott has a very distinct tone and vision, and it's really interesting to take horror and put a really human take on it. Dad, I heard something. Oh, yeah, what'd you hear? All of Scott's films deal with real people in real environments and real situations in an honest way that make it a mirror to society or a slice of time in that world. He handles tension really beautifully, and he handles uh, both the softer, more emotional side of uh, humans and the more brutal side of humanity. He's not your responsibility. He has no one. He is my responsibility. When Scott approached me for this, horror and this genre was a new thing for both of us. And just after having a conversation with him and things he'd said that Guillermo had said, I just thought it'd be fun to live in their world. What they both have is they both bring artistry to it. And you're gonna walk very slowly, very scared. Remember, there's a monster lurking behind that door. As a filmmaker, how could I talk about what's happening in America today and draw those themes into the horror genre? Uh, because I think the best horror films generally touch on uh, societal concerns. He responded to the screenplay the right way. He read it, and he started talking about themes, uh, character. You know, I think that the last thing you want is somebody talking about a horror movie in horror movie terms. You want somebody that is trying to make a statement about himself, and, and the movie seems to matter thematically to them. JT, stop there. Cut. Cut. Got it. <laughs> The addiction to our natural resources have been quite important to me. Our addiction to greed, our addiction to opioids, and how addiction feeds into our deepest and darkest impulses. That's what the Wendigo represents. Scott's films are typically kind of unblinking, ultra-realistic dramas. And this is that, but it also has a supernatural element. Lucas. You want to read us your story? It's a balance where the more real the movie feels, the more effect the supernatural has an effect on us. One day, Little Bear came home, and Big Bear and Baby Bear were different. What you see is a town that was once a mining town. It was once prosperous, there was money, there was goodwill between neighbors, and now the mine is closed, there's addiction, there's poverty, there's, I mean, all these things that are transformative. A lot of these towns that have been affected by the opioid crisis, and to me, that was always the analogy for the monster, is the destruction of families and the force that causes just strife in children's lives. That is a cry for help. Take it from someone who can diagnose abuse. People are dying every day, and lives are being destroyed and ruined and households shattered with drug addiction, and it's something we need to look at. It is like a Russian nesting doll of pain and abandonment and exploitation and abuse. It is the right uh, type of horror movie that talks about things that are real, through things that are not. This is what was in the mine. You know, we use the Wendigo myth essentially as a metaphor for what's going on today. So there's the human side of it, but there's also the Earth is angry at what is happening to the Earth. Fires are burning, and places are flooding, and tsunamis are coming, and all those other things. This is a monster with antlers who kind of represents all of that. That is the myth coming down on us. 
The Wendigo really represents a vindication of nature and a sense of peril at our own risk, whether that be the depletion of our natural resources, whether that be addiction to uh, opioids or methamphetamine that unfortunately is, is ravaging our nation. So it really is, the Wendigo is about us. Can anyone give me an example of a myth or a story they're afraid of? Elevated horror. It's a new term that people like, but you know, I think David Cronenberg was elevated horror. I think Romero was elevated horror. The horror is elevated in many of its exceptions. We just happen to be in an era in which filmmaking in the genre is taken as an, as an artistic endeavor. I've been doing it all my life since Kronos. Kronos was conceived like that, Devil's Backbone, Pan's Labyrinth. And I take things that are very common to the genre and I try to execute them in a different way. And uh, I think right now there is an independent spirit, almost like an indie film spirit, that has embraced horror not just as a stepping stone towards bigger productions, but as really solid artistic statements about who we are as individuals or as a nation or as a world. Big Bear got sick. And his insides turned black. <laughs> In horror, you use elements that are very much fanciful or poetic or almost fairy tale like. Horror and fairy tales are one single tree trunk, two different branches. You know, but essentially, Hansel and Gretel is a horror tale. Two kids left in the woods are found by a witch that wants to eat their flesh. That's not exactly, you know, soothing. Lucas? The beauty of a Wendigo or a, a myth like that is that it can be found in many, many cultures, different names, they represent different things, they have different specificity, but there's always uh, an elemental spirit that is a guardian of the woods or the representation of human emotion or human spoilage. This is a myth you're talking about. Our ancestral spirits never died. They were here long before we were and they'll be here long after we are gone. But now they're angry. The importance of myth is that it represents something larger than us, larger than our human pettiness. It is a metaphor made flesh, and it's truly a, a powerful connection between what we do to nature, what we do to each other, and if we can make it incarnate into this creature, it's extremely important to, to be able to bring it in like a fable. The setting for this film, as it is in, in all of my films, is quite important. Uh, I wanted to set it in the dark, mysterious folds of the Oregon mountains, but it was important that I created a town, uh, Cispus Falls, Oregon, that felt like it could be any town in America. It's this northwestern, rundown town that I don't know that it was ever hugely prosperous, but it certainly isn't now. I barely recognize this place anymore. Well, a lot can change in 20 years. What we discussed coming into the film is, is sort of the state of America, especially small town America. You know, like mining towns, for instance. We basically tried to keep the overall look of the town very earth tones, desperate and dark, sort of clinging to life, really. Scott fought very hard to make the movie moody. He wanted the fog and the trees, and he said, I want the atmosphere, I want the real places. It was important for me to 
shine a light on small towns. Having grown up in small town Virginia, that's important to me. And also to really understand the familial bond in the film because our protagonist was, was raised in this small town for the first 18 years of her life. The Meadows house needed to be trapped in time on the inside and bringing in Paul and Julia's life. It was difficult. I mean, just every piece of furniture that she sort of walked away from and without being too heavy handed about it. It was the first big set that we handed off and it sort of set the tone for the rest of the film. Scott Cooper wanted real, you know, whatever sets that we created and or locations that we augmented feel grounded. And so when we do introduce the mythical Wendigo, it, it's more impactful. There's no substitute for reality. It's a really atmospheric movie, but not in a gothic way. That's the beauty. It's a very American myth, and it's a very American uh, horror movie. Lucas? <laughs> One of the main reasons that I decided to do this film is because of Guillermo del Toro. Guillermo is, is, is a master of creating creatures. Now, very slowly, very slowly. Put your weight on your front paws and all that. It's really impressive to see the different phases of the transformation, the stuff of nightmares. It's pretty grotesque and scary. It's definitely um, in line with Guillermo's creations. Guillermo has an extremely unique perspective on monsters and how to create them, almost uh, unlike anybody else. You have some sculptural detail here that is post He really has almost like this, this childlike exuberance in creating these particular creatures because he has such a encyclopedic knowledge about almost every creature that's ever been made that he wants to feel wholly unique and wholly unique to this project and what it represents on a metaphorical level and no detail is too small. I worked with Guy Davis and Scott into finding the design for the Wendigo, one of the great figures of representation of a king of a forest is, uh, is the antlers, you know, is the crown of antlers on a stag. And Guy and I tried to find a symmetry that was almost uh, like ornamental on the antler design. I suggested that we erase the eyes to make it blind, because it's like blind rage or is inhuman. And if you give it the teeth of the skull, it seems to be just hungry. We spent a long time drawing it and a long time sculpting it, and it was so gorgeous. And I think Shane and Legacy did a fantastic execution of that. The main task for us at Legacy was to create the physical being itself of the Wendigo. We've never done a, 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 a Wendigo creature. We've never done this mythology. We've done mermaids, we've done, you know, werewolves, but I think a Native American spirit creature, it was fun. Let's mock it up and show you. Yeah. Can you have like a before and after so I can see this and then... We must have, have given Shane and the guys at Legacy pages and pages of notes and continued to evolve over the course of many, many months so that it felt unlike anything you'd seen in film, yet was representative of everything we were trying to say in this particular film. All right, Jeremy, good. Let's get quiet, please. This Wendigo that you see behind me is a part of an ancestral spirit that has lived inside the core of the earth for hundreds of years. In terms of how Guillermo and I have designed this particular uh, god, it really isn't a monster because it represents uh, a vindication of nature, but, but a particular god that has been reawakened. It's eight feet tall. The conundrum is it has to be as lightweight as possible because 
there's a man inside of it, but if it's too light, it just falls apart. They tried to make it as lightweight as possible, but then the arms go on, and then the legs go on, and the chest cavity, and then the headpiece that go on, like, the shoulder pads on my shoulders. It's roughly around 55 pounds. It's very sophisticated animatronic. It's telemetry-driven head and neck. It's one of the most advanced robotic servo creatures we've done in a long time. Turn! When we turn and look to make a move, it'd be like, and turn, I have to know that head's turning, I can hear the servos going, and then I turn. The forearm and the fingers are like almost three feet long, so I have to puppeteer those through the suit. We're gonna have certain shots in the movie where parts of the body are digital and parts of the body are the suit performer. I mean, if you blend a puppet with a digital performance, the audience can decide which technique is being used, therefore, their brain accepts that it may be real, or at least an operatic character that they can find some uh, awe. Lucas? We have this devastatingly scary, but kind of beautiful creature, but he's huge, first of all. And it's so interesting to actually work with a moving creature and not just have to imagine all of it. The Wendigo, it's, it's a mythological creature, but it's kind of like a god. It doesn't necessarily have fear that much of anything else, so it moves like a god. It, you know, it takes its time. There is a very tall, thin man in a suit, partially. And then there are many people working its claws and its hands and its neck and its jaw and its tongue. And I do sort of fight it. <laughs> Being able to bring a presence like that into the movement of the character, it's awesome. It's such a dance, and everybody kind of collaborates together. And cut. Great, Dorian. The directing style of Scott and sort of the intensity of what he brings and then the, the knowledge that Guillermo has with creature creation, you get a great fusion of two different things. And it's Guillermo's passion and enthusiasm and that vast experience and knowledge in creating creatures that I think made this as, as good as it is. Mazika Makweyan, Ogi Inaga Awan, Ogi Gamo de Mawan. Myth is a very important part of Antlers because we really unearth the Native American mythology of the Wendigo, which is quite important in uh, Algonquin culture. The Anishinaabe Moan term for Wendigo literally means greed. For us in our communities, any kind of excessiveness of greed is perhaps one of the most heinous things that one could be. Scott and I have had long conversations about the Wendigo is an allegory where there is a spirit or a power or a force that comes to reconcile what the people are doing incorrectly. It's the Wendigo translates to a diabolical wickedness that, uh, that devours mankind. It's not only destroying the earth, but abuse. Whether it happens in a family, it happens to a country, it happens to the environment. Uh, all this rage, all this abuse uh, incarnates. It's like an invocation for this creature, which is the Wendigo. Our images of the Wendigo, it didn't become just these forms of overlaid allegories. It actually started becoming very, very real. <laughs> The Wendigo myth was born out of this notion that when the uh, Europeans and the English settled, that they cannibalized all of the resources that Native Americans subsisted upon, leaving the Native Americans essentially to starve. That ties into all sorts of threads, you know, in terms of climate change. These are allegories where we would tell stories in an effort to survive, in an effort to teach 
And that was across all cultures, not just native culture. A cautionary tale to the indigenous people who believe in it. Native American and indigenous causes have been quite important to me because you realize that the historical traumas that they have dealt with for centuries is continuing to this day. The Wendigo has a message to bring, and the message is the Earth has been here for millions of years, and we won't destroy the Earth, but she'll destroy us. The Wendigo represents all of us in our deepest and darkest impulses. And I think a film like this hopefully will allow people to see not only a part of themselves in this, but what we can do going forward. Big Bear got sick, and his insides turned black. Cut! Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. I've always been a fan of Scott's films. Uh, he's a director that I wanted to work with. So when we started talking about this project, I, I was immediately excited and intrigued because he tells the kind of stories that I want to be a part of. On set, we're collaborating on how to approach scenes. He's flexible. He's only committed to the truth and um, approaching scenes in an honest, raw way, which make them powerful. We find Frank um, in a situation that a lot of individuals find themselves in, in in today's society. People that are at the their wits end, caught up in the opioid crisis, and it's a very serious problem. No. When I got the role, I, I, I weighed 209 pounds. I was at 134 this week. I can honestly say I've never worked harder and longer to physically prepare for something because I knew who I was working with. I knew the story we were telling. I had a vision for it, and um, I was completely supported by Scott and working with people. And it was a four-month journey. It's what needed to happen. Look at me. Daddy's very very sick. You lock that fucking door. No matter what I do, you don't open that door. Frank has so many stages. When we first meet his character, we did a lot of breakdown to his skin, a little bit of sort of meth scarring. And again, his hair and his wigs help create his character and his clothes. And he's lost a lot of weight during the filming or to prepare for this character. So he really wants to be, you know, gaunt and weak. And he's very committed to the, the process. You gotta realize everybody's sacrificing something. You know, we're all putting a little bit of our blood, sweat, and tears into this thing to honor this story, to honor the imagination of Guillermo del Toro and what he brings to cinema to step into the shoes of somebody who's gonna be one of his monsters. His monsters are normally fully formed. This was the birth. You get to see where this creature, this monster started from. It is what you live for as an artist. Especially if you're going to do a horror film as an actor, this is the one. It's been a long road for me preparing for this, and it's something that I'll, I'll get to walk away from knowing I gave it everything I had. And I worked with the best, and the movie's gonna be damn good. And I know that people are really, really gonna have a fun time watching this, and it's gonna stand the test of time. Big Bear has become more angrier. But they had each other.